So we decided to talk about upper extremity and low back because those are the two body areas where most of the injuries occur that we see here. So what are work-related musculoskeletal disorders? This is a definition that was put out by the um, Ontario, what's, what's Oscar? Health and Safety Committee of Ontario. The Occupational Health and Safety Committee of Ontario, thank you. So work-related musculoskeletal disorders are injuries of the musculoskeletal system. So that's the ligaments, the muscles, the tendons, the bones, the blood vessels, the nerves. So it can occur to any of these soft tissues where you have an exposure to some risk factors that are maybe present in the workplace that have either contributed to this disorder or may have aggravated a pre-existing condition. So what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to look at each joint with the upper extremity. So I'm going to look at the shoulder, the elbow, and the wrist. And with the wrist, obviously, you have the hand as well. So I'll talk about some of the disorders in the hands and the common ones that we see. I'll talk about the disorders, and then I'll talk about some of the research literature, what the research says are the work-related factors that can develop due to exposure. So with the shoulder, you have rotator cuff tendonitis. There are four rotator cuff tendons in your shoulder. Um, sometimes people think it's one tendon. There, there are four, so it could be one of the tendons, it could be two of the tendons. Um, and it, because it's a tendonitis, it's an inflammation of the tendon. Bursitis, there are bursas in the shoulder joint, and the bursas are what stop the tendons and the ligaments from rubbing on the bone. So you can inflame the bursa in the shoulder. You can develop frozen shoulder, uh, and you can get that from uh, you know, not addressing maybe a tendonitis. If you have an injury that develops to a certain extent and you lose mobility, you can actually develop frozen shoulder. And thoracic outlet, which I'm not going to speak a lot to thoracic outlet. It's not one of the more common injuries, but you have nerves that pass through between your ribs and the clavicle, and if you compress those nerves, you can get a nerve disorder. You can get symptoms in your hands, and that's where it is from overhead work. Um, sh a lot of shoulder elevation can do compression there. The one thing with the shoulder joint is it's a very complex joint. It's, there's a lot of articulations, and it has a, a wide range of movement, okay? So if you compare it to the knee, for example, the knee basically flexes and extends. It does two movements. It also has some rotation, very minor. So it's not a very mobile joint. However, it's a very stable joint. Well, unfortunately, the shoulder is very mobile, but at a cost, and it's the cost is stability. So it's not a stable joint, and that's why we see a lot of shoulder injuries. And what NIOSH would tell you is, oops, too fast. The evidence. NIOSH, the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, some years ago, put together a document. And what, it, what they did was they looked at all the research evidence, compiled that information and said, where does the research show that there's work-relatedness? So they have one area, uh, a chapter, just on the shoulder. And what they basically concluded was that there is a positive relationship to doing highly repetitive work alone and shoulder musculoskeletal disorders. There's also evidence for a positive relationship between doing repeated or sustained shoulder postures greater than 60 degrees of either flexion. So this is shoulder flexion. This is abduction. And so this is 90 degrees. This is about 45. So doing repeated 60 degree shoulder flexion can lead to the development of musculoskeletal disorders. And the evidence is very strong, strong evidence with a positive association when you're combining factors. So if you're exposed to repetitiveness, um, force, awkward postures. The, the, it becomes a strong relationship. I got a director at this thing. So hand, wrist, finger. So first off, a common is carpal tunnel syndrome. And carpal tunnel syndrome is a nerve disorder in the wrist. Sometimes people will get symptoms of CTS, carpal tunnel. So you'll get numbness. It's like Jeff was talking, you know, you get symptoms in your foot, and, and it's because of the bulging disc in your back. It's the same with your arm. You could get numbness and tingling and pain in your hand, and it's actually coming from maybe a bulging disc or herniated disc in your neck. So it's important to get a proper diagnosis. So if you are diagnosed, if you get nerve conduction testing and they say CTS, it's because you've damaged the nerve at the wrist, and it's the median nerve. The work-relatedness, the, the risk factors are doing repeated uh, wrist movements, repeated gripping, excessive gripping, prolonged gripping, and non-neutral postures. And I'll look at the NIOSH with all of this at the end. There's also trigger finger. 
which is a stenosing tenosynovitis. So the tendons that move your fingers, it, you know, you've got the muscles in your forearms that become tendons. Tendons attach the muscle to the bone. And you could get a couple of different muscle groups that attach to one tendon. So it's the tendon that generates the force and moves the joint. The ligaments are what stabilize each joint, and they attach bone to bone. So just a little bit of an anatomy class. So I actually developed trigger finger, and I don't know why I, I developed it. I think it's from years of cracking my knuckles, and for some reason I developed it in my hand. And what happens is, is you get an inflammation on the tendon, on the finger joint. From You can get it from gripping as well. So workers who have to do repetitive, prolonged, forceful gripping, holding tools, or even doing a one finger trigger on a tool, what they're doing now is designing tools with two finger, three finger, whole hand triggers. And that's the reason for it. Because if you're doing this, our fingers weren't designed to do this all day. So you could develop uh, trigger fingers. So you develop, you get an inflammation, eventually you'll get a nodule on the tendon. And what happens is, is you bend your finger and you have these bands that go across your hand that stop everything from popping out and hold everything in place. Well, the nodule passes under that band and then it gets caught. So I would be holding a cup of coffee and I'd go to put it down and my finger was locked. So what they ended up having to do was going into surgery and remove the nodule, scrape it all up, and now it's fine. Um, so that's trigger finger. Also, this is a, one we see quite a bit of as well. Maybe not at this clinic so much, but in Sudbury, I know they get a lot of hand arm vibration. Um, so it has hand arm vibration, and there's also white finger. And white finger is kind of one of the things that can develop if you are exposed to operating vibrating tools. So sanders, grinders. Um, also, if you're exposed, if you work out in the cold for workers that work outside, they can actually just develop white finger. I developed white finger as a runner from not wearing mitts. I would wear gloves, and I have developed now some white fingers. So when I do get exposed to the cold now, I get that blanching of my fingers on the right. So you can get it from, from, and sometimes what workers will develop with white finger, if you have, if you develop carpal tunnel syndrome, white finger is a blood vessel disorder. Um, so if you get carpal tunnel syndrome, the nerves are what innervate all the soft tissue in your hand. So it tells the muscles to work, um, you know, it's, it sends information to the blood vessel. So if the, if the nerve isn't working properly, then sometimes you can end up with, with uh, white finger because of that. So it's kind of a development. So um, I did the work relating this. De Quervain's disease, again, is a tenosynovitis, and it's the tendon that does the thumb movement, controls your thumb. So again, workers using tools that require repetitive gripping, deviation of the wrist joint, um, and again, gripping with force with repetitive movements. Again, you know, our hands were also even, um, if you do a job, I've worked in different plants and been in different plants. If you're doing a job where you're doing forceful pushing with the thumb, if you're inserting something, you know, our hand was not designed to do that. Um, we talk about what, trying to get workers working in neutral posture. So this is actually neutral posture for your hand. This is not neutral for your hand. So when I say neutral, I mean all the joints, there's no contraction of the muscles occurring at the joint. And you can, when you have to generate a force, you want to be in a neutral position to start that because that's when you're your strongest, okay? So, and the thumb was designed to work in opposition with the fingers, this finger and your hand. That's what it, so it really wasn't designed. I had a, someone actually from the Windsor Star call me about um, uh, blackberry thumb. And why are, what is blackberry thumb? It's de veins, and that's what it's from. It's from punching in and doing this with your thumb. Again, your thumb was not designed to do this repetitively. Um, there was a time when they had, what was the toy the kids used? Game the hand thing, G Game Boy? Yeah. They were developing, <laughs> children were developing to veins from that as well. So again, it, we weren't designed to do that with our hands. So, National Institute says they've shown, they put all, looked at all the research, they said there's an evidence of a positive relationship between highly repetitive work alone, again, and CTS. So you don't necessarily have to be doing really forceful hand movements. If you're doing a really highly repetitive pinch gripping uh, job or, you know, fast wrist movements, um, you can develop CTS. There's strong evidence for a positive relationship, again, between a combination 
of exposure, uh, exposure to a combination of the factors. So if you're looking at force and repetition or force and posture. There's also a positive relationship between any single factor and hand wrist tendonitis. And there's strong evidence, again, when you look at being exposed to a combination of those factors. Most people aren't usually ex exposed to one single factor. It's usually a combination of factors. Strong evidence for a relationship between high level of exposures to hand-arm vibration and halves white finger. So if, you're, if you know somebody who has to operate a, a vibrating tool, they're actually starting now to see some problems with dental hygienists. Again, Ivan mentioned I've been doing some work with the dental hygienists in, in Ontario. There's 8,000 dental hygienists in this province, and they are not covered by WSIB. For whatever reason, their employers are not obligated to provide uh, compensation. So what they've done is, we, say, we have a saying in ergonomics, for everything you fix, you screw something else up. So they've advocated for hygienists is not to do um, as much hand scaling. You know, they go in and they scale your, clean your teeth. They're saying you should use the ultrasonic scalers. So what they do is they do, it's like a power tool, and it, it's, it's a water pressure type tool, and what it does is does some of the bulk cleaning so they don't have to do as much hand scaling. The problem is, is those tools vibrate. So now they may not be getting the, the problems with the scaling, but now they're being exposed to vibration. So they're starting to do some, some testing with that. And again, substantial evidence that as the intensity and the duration of the exposure to the vibrating tool increases, the risk of developing halves also increases. So if you're using the tools all day. Elbow injuries. So the most common are medial and lateral epicondylitis. So again, um, you have all the, the muscles in your forearm that do this. So when you, when you grip, you can feel that force in your forearm muscles. Well, that also generates a force to your elbow when you're doing that. Uh, if you're doing hand up, hand down movements, that movement comes from your elbow joint. That's elbow supination and elbow pronation. So if you're doing repetitive or forceful elbow pronation, supination, if you think about people that do cleaning and have to do a lot of ringing type movements, they're, they're exposed because it's a combination of the gripping and then the pronation. So has anyone ever seen a worker or someone with um, the bands that they have around their elbow? Uh, I remember I worked, I've worked in several physio clinics as well, and I remember one of the physiotherapists saying, that's the one thing that actually works. You know, you see the wrist wraps and, and so on. That's the one thing that works because the idea is, is that it actually dissipates the force, so you're not getting as much force. When you do that, all that force goes onto one tendon and inserts onto one point on your elbow. So this is the lateral side, this is the medial. Um, so what that does is by having the band, when you're doing that, it disperses the force so you're not getting it onto the one area at the elbow joint. So um, again, repetitive forearm motions, wrist, again, can develop problems at the elbow joint, and again, pronation, supination. And there's also olecranon bursitis, because again, you have bursas at every joint, so that can also, if you're doing, if you have constant elbow um, pressure, so leaning your elbow on something, truck drivers, that have to lean their elbows, that lean their elbows on um, the, the uh, door, uh, that can cause inflammation to the bursa. And again, NIOSH, evidence of a positive relationship between forceful work and epicondylitis, so forceful gripping, forceful pronation, supination, and again, strong evidence, strong evidence when you're doing uh, forceful and repetitive work involving flexion, elbow flexion, wrist flexion, supination and pronation, and epicondylitis. There actually wasn't, um, NIOSH said that they, there wasn't a strong or evidence of a relationship between posture and epicondylitis on its own. It's usually, it's the repetitiveness and the forcefulness. So, prevention strategies. Well, the idea is, and I've kind of put the top two, so reducing forces. So, reducing forces for manual tear handling. So even, you know, that could be a problem for your back. It can also be a problem for your shoulder and for your upper extremities. And reducing forces with gripping. And we'll talk about how, how some of the things you can do to reduce that. Eliminate or reduce static and awkward postures. So again, if a tool in some uh, plants, in, if it's unionized, the, con the union has put in their contract that 
if they have kind of their own guidelines sometimes. So if a tool weighs more than a certain amount, let's say 10 pounds, that tool must be on a balancer. Okay, so the balancer takes the weight of the tool, it eliminates the fact that they have to statically hold it, and it reduces some of the force for gripping when they're, when they're grabbing the tool because the balancer is taking up some of the weight of the tool. Overhead work, that's, that's a really, really bad uh, posture for the shoulders. Even seating for office environments, so providing armrests, that can reduce some of the stress for the shoulder joint. Um, even, uh, you know, ha making sure that your mouse is at the same level as your keyboard. If you do, if you're on your computer a lot during the day, and you have your keyboard on a keyboard tray and your mouse on your desk, and you're doing this type of movement all day, again, you know, 60 degrees of shoulder flexion, repetitive, can lead to shoulder problems. So, uh, improving your working postures, improving the reach that you have to, to utilize. Uh, the guidelines would say anything that has to, you have to reach for on a frequent to constant basis. So frequent, let's say, being anywhere from 50%, 40% more, okay, should be done within a forearm's reach because they know, again, the shoulder joint is very mobile but very unstable. So even just repetitive shoulder movements all day can uh, lead to shoulder problems. Uh, proper tool design, we'll talk about what some of that can be. And then again, manual material handling. Improve the repetition rate. So you can do that in a couple of ways. Just by improving the work to rest, rest ratio improves that, the repetitiveness and how the repetitiveness factor, you know, what type of implications it has. Because, you know, we can do a certain amount of work repetitively, but you have to make sure you're giving the muscles a certain amount of rest, okay? And the example I like to use for this is if it's a static posture, so this is dynamic movement, shoulder flexion. Because every time I bring my arm up, the muscles contract in the shoulder joint. Every time I bring it down, they, re they rest, they relax. And when the muscle relaxes, blood gets in, drops off the oxygen, takes away the byproduct of contraction, which is lactic acid. So I may be able to do this for let's say an hour. Um, but then I'm going to start to feel fatigued because I will get fatigued doing this. I may need five minutes of recovery and then I can do it again. However, if I'm just holding my arm out there, this is static. It's the muscles contracted and it stays contract. No blood flow going in, no oxygen. You're going to start to feel a burn. That's a buildup of lactic acid. And that's what creates a lot of damage. I mean, just the fact that you're not getting oxygen should tell you it's not a good thing. So I may be able to do this for three minutes, but then I'm going to need 15 minutes of recovery. So depending on what you're doing, the postures, the extent of the postures, the amount of force, that all plays into, because we get this question all the time. How much repetition is too much? And that's a huge question. And we always say, well, it depends. It depends on the forces, the postures. Um, and so, and in some cases, if you can't improve some of those other factors, it may be a fact if you need to reduce the repetition. So they're not doing it as much. In some cases, they may have to put another worker onto that line if it doesn't fit within the guidelines. And reduce or eliminate, or in fact, well, I guess sometimes you can't eliminate the vibration, but you can reduce it in certain ways by tool design and glove use. So he, oops. See, too much coffee. So just some of the things that you can utilize to improve postures, improve force, improve, you know, even repetition in some cases. So you see this a lot in the plants where they have uh, tilt bins. Again, that just eliminates the reach. Um, this as well, uh, the forces, tool design, anti-vibration gloves. Um, and even the vibration, they have guidelines. I've, I've printed this off. If anyone would like a copy of it, if you utilize tools in your workplace, it's a hand tool design document I got off the website. And this is Professor Allen Head. She's a very, very well-known ergonomics uh, professor. And it's a really good document. It talks all about the different things that need to be considered for tool design. Um, the shape of the tool, the handles, compression, uh, grip design, talks about different tools, pliers and scissors and so on. So it's, it's a really good document. Another thing about gloves I'd like to do, mention is that you, if you're providing gloves in the workplace, you have to ensure that they fit because actually glove use can create a risk factor. If the gloves don't fit, 
Um, you automatically use more force, grip, pinch gripping force when you have a glove on because you lose your proprioception in your hands. So you have to apply more force to get the feedback to know how much force you're putting on there. So if the gloves are too large, you can actually end up using more force if they don't fit properly. Uh, if the gloves are too tight, that will restrict blood flow. So you have to make sure you're providing different size gloves in the workforce because not everybody has the, right, the same size hands. Um, this is a problem for, again, dental hygienists. Uh, part of the problem is if you're doing pinch gripping all day long, let's say you know somebody who has, does a job like that, sometimes like the latex glove they provide, latex gloves are um, ambidextrous. So they fit both the right and left hands. But remember I was saying your hand is not designed like this. It's, this is neutral for your hand. You're designed to, pin, to grip this way. So if they're wearing latex gloves all day, which they do, same with nurses, for example, some nurses wear them all day, they're actually working against the glove all day long because it's, the glove is designed like this to fit both hands. They have gloves that are right-handed and left-handed gloves. And that's what we recommend if you're wearing them all day and wearing them frequently. Okay, they're a little more expensive, but it may, it's a huge factor. Again, work organization, this is, this is a guideline we use. Um, you know, if you're at a work environment, sorry, see, I'm going too, too much. Just some computer workstation solutions. They have different uh, keyboard trays. Again, this type of tray just um, allows you to use more neutral uh, elbow and wrist postures. Um, sometimes less force. Uh, this is a mouse. This eliminates the reach, allows you to use the mouse with both hands so it can reduce some of the repetitiveness of mousing with one hand. And again, this is some dental hygiene. If you know a dental hygienist and they're having problems, send them here because I've got a lot of information about this. They're making the tools larger. They've done this with pens. They've enlarged the grip. The larger it is, to a certain extent, there's an optimum. You use less force. They've textured the tools. When they're textured, they don't have to put as much force again. It allows you to reduce the forces. And again, I have another document. This is uh, I got this from Laura Monroe. She's the ergonomist at uh, Hamilton. It's a tool use questionnaire for musculoskeletal disorders of the upper limb. So it's just a little questionnaire to, to ask regarding the tool use.